French police close in on suspects linked to the Charlie Hebdo massacre. Several people are said to have been wounded at Dan Martin en Goule, that's uh, 35 kilometres from Paris, but officials denied reports of deaths. Negotiations between the gunmen and police are now underway, reports say. The development comes nearly 48 hours after the attack on the magazine's office when 12 people were shot dead. The heavily armed gunmen fled Paris by cars after the attack. A convoy of police vehicles have been seen heading by motorway to that small town. This from the front page of the Irish Daily Mail today, written by Kevin Keane, and he reports that a senior member of the Cabinet has said he believes the ban on blasphemy should be removed from the Constitution. Agriculture Minister Simon Coveney spoke out as a number of senior Irish Muslim clerics hit out at cartoons that parodied the Prophet Muhammad intentionally. One Dublin imam said that Wednesday's attack was not only an attack on the French nation and freedom of expression, but on Islam itself. However, another figure in the Irish Islamic community said he would be in favour of using Ireland's controversial blasphemy law uh, to prosecute any person who published or reproduced the controversial cartoons first distributed by the Paris-based magazine Charlie Hebdo. Ali Selen, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a senior member of the Islamic Cultural Centre of Ireland, said last night that he would definitely seek legal advice if cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad were reprinted by media, at media outlets here. However, Dr. Umar al-Khwadri, he's the imam of the Al-Mustafa Islamic Educational and Cultural Centre in West Dublin, said the tragedy was not only an attack on the French nation and on the freedom of expression, but on Islam itself. He said what happened is affecting every Muslim Muslim. When such events takes place, a lot of people will assume the majority of Muslims accept or condone this behaviour, while the reality is that this is the action of individuals. Joining me now online is my first guest, and he's Sheikh Umar from the Al Mustafa Islamic Centre in Dublin. Good morning, Umar, and welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Would you share your, the thoughts and the opinions of your Imam on this one? I am actually the person that uh, gave that statement. I am the Imam. I'm oh, my apologies. my apologies. My no apologies. No problem at all. So obviously, these are your feelings on the matter. They are indeed. They are indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, it is in, uh, an horrific uh, incident that has, has taken place, and and unfortunately, it is not an isolated in, incident. Uh, we have seen in the past, uh, recently in Syria and in Iraq, we have seen such incidents also, where innocent people are being killed in the name of. Islam. And I think it is, it is the time that now Muslim leaders stand up and, uh, you know, accept that there is a problem uh, of radicalization. There is a problem that uh, one, there is a reason why are the youth, Muslim youth from the West, why are they, you know, uh, migrating? Why are they traveling to Syria and Iraq to participate in a war that is not their war? So there is, a, a, you know, a process of radicalization that takes place and we have to accept that. And I think this is maybe the right time to now speak openly against it, uh, rather than just condemning. Um, I, just, I don't just condemn what happened. At the same time, I'd like to see that certain uh, measurements are taken, not only by, uh, by, of course, the authorities, but at the same time by Muslim uh, leaders and Muslim uh, leadership that will, uh, that will minimize uh, such incidents, and in fact, I annihilated such incidents. Now, you're quoted in the mail as, as saying that you personally are, are, well, you're not offended by caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad unless those caricatures are intended to incite hatred. Where does that leave the whole notion of blasphemy with, within Islam? I think uh, the, the notion of blasphemy is uh, highly misunderstood, not only by uh, by non-Muslims when it comes to Islam, but at, at the same time by Muslims. Uh, because uh, blasphemy uh, is not very simple. You know, if you draw a cartoon of the Prophet, it is not uh, blasphemy. It is not uh, in that category. There, is, uh, there, is, there are legal uh, requirements to be fulfilled uh, before, you can, uh, before you can label something as blasphemous in the Islamic law. And we have, even then, we have different rules of thought within the Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic law. We have the Hanafi law, the, the Shafi'i law, the Maliki, the Hanbali law. So I think it's not so simple. When we talk about caricatures or when we talk about anyone criticizing Islam, this is not something new. It happened in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and uh, it's something that even is mentioned and stated in the Quran, how the people used to criticize him, how they used to make mockery of him. 
so this is not something new. Uh, at this, we, at the same time, find in the Quran and we find in the life of the Prophet how he dealt with it. And I think that is a lot of Muslims are actually forgetting that uh, they are they're ignoring that or they're not be, being told that how did the Prophet actually react to this. So if anyone draws uh, a cartoon or if anyone criticizes Islam, it is not offensive to me. No. In fact, I think this gives me an opportunity of dialogue. It gives me an opportunity to sit down with that person. And I think I believe there must be some misunderstanding why that person is criticizing or why that person is drawing with caricature. However, at the same time, I do believe that you must differentiate between, uh, you know, criticizing or between just caricatures and between caricatures or, uh, or text that incites to hatred. So if anyone incites to hatred, Obviously, that is something totally different, and that is not acceptable. And for that, if anyone wants to go through the legal uh, proceedings and uh, follow the legal route, that is... Uh, but uh, who decides what caricature is inciting a person to hatred and what piece of satire or caricature is not? I think that is up to the courts to decide uh, whether uh, a caricature is inciting to hatred or not. That is not up to the people. And, and this is the whole issue at the moment also in the Islamic world that people, individuals, take the law in their own hands. We have, in, I'm originally from Pakistan. In Pakistan, a minister was killed by one of his guardsmen, uh, one of his guards, uh, because the guard believed that this person was blasphemous and he, he uh, must be killed. And he, uh, he, he killed him, unfortunately. It's a very tragic incident. And we find that within, uh, in Pakistan, some religious groups, until today, are in fact praising this, uh, this horrific act of killing a minister. Uh, at the same time, we have Muslim leadership, Muslim scholars, theologians that are speaking against it and saying that, first of all, even if it was blasphemous, this is something to, for the courts to decide. This is not up to individuals to decide what is blasphemous, what is not blasphemous. There is a proper uh, you know, procedure uh, within Islamic legal framework that has to be followed. But it's very hard to keep control way. on extremists, isn't it? No matter what uh, religious banner they might be holding up. And, that's, Sorry, and, that, and, and that is the nub of this, isn't it? Sorry, can you repeat that again? It's it, it is very hard to, be, to take control of a, a radical element in any religion who chooses to, to use the religion, however distorted they might, yes, yes. So their, I, their vision I, I of it might I be. Agree. Yeah. I agree with that. However, I think one of the uh, uh, one of the issue, or one of the you can say important things that people do not realize is that within Islam, the Prophet of Islam, 1400 years ago, had already highlighted, had already foretold us about extremism that will be found by people that will claim his religion. The Prophet himself, 1400 years ago, foretold that there will be certain individuals, certain groups. And they will be in a minority, and they will they will have the appearance of Muslims. They will believe that they will be Muslims. They will pray. They will believe in the in the fundamentals of Islam. However, the Prophet categorically said, however, they will not be believers. And this this is a category of people that exists even today. And there is a specific term that is given by Islamic scholars and the Prophet himself to them. This term is the Khawarij, the Khawarij. So the Khawarij are the, uh, terrorists and individuals and extremists with that, that associate themselves with Islam. The Prophet had already foretold us this. Okay. And I think this is the time that Muslim leaders, Muslim scholars actually speak openly uh, against and about Khawarij and identify who are Khawarij and who are not Khawarij. Now, the Al Mustafa Islamic Cultural Center in Dublin, you issued a statement yesterday, and one thing I was particularly struck, one line particularly struck me was this one. Uh, you said that free speech is not a Western concept, it is a universal craving of the human soul. The gunmen ran away shouting that they were avenging the Prophet Muhammad. How dare they? We cannot let the murderers define Islam. Does free speech exist within Islam? It does. It does. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, uh, for some, uh, in some Muslim countries, it does not exist, but that does not mean that it does not exist in Islam. We are the example to follow for us, uh, the Islamic uh, you know, example, and our teachings are not derived from, uh, from a constitution of any country, whether it is Saudi Arabia or whether it is Pakistan. Uh, the Islamic teachings are derived from the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the prophetic conduct. We find in the life of the Prophet, we find in the Quran, the, the Book of God, that we believe is the Book of God, we believe that there is in that 
there is freedom of speech is mentioned. And in fact, one of the reasons that the Prophet of Islam in his life was prosecuted was because uh, he was not allowed to practice the religion of Islam. He was not allowed to propagate. Uh, so there was a ban on freedom of speech. And this was the reason that he had to migrate from Mecca to Medina. And, and when he came in power, when he became the state head in Medina, he ensured that freedom of religion, freedom of speech is uh, part of Islam. Okay, now part of freedom of speech is satire. Fair enough. So within Islam, would imams like yourself tolerate satirical writing? You see, I think there is a difference. Uh, I think even with freedom of speech, when we say that it is part of Islam, uh, we believe that freedom of speech is not absolute. Uh, there, is, there is freedom of speech, but it is, of course, limited. It, if freedom of speech, in, in the name of freedom of speech, somebody infringes the human rights of another person, for example, uh, you know, then in that particular stage, you know, we have to limit freedom of speech. It is not uh, absolute and it is not unlimited. This is something that Islam, you know, differentiates. But again, you know, that's very hard to, to define. One person's limits is not another person's limits when it comes to, to this area. I think it's not about the, the limits of individuals. I think it's, it's about the limit of uh, the, the, the faith itself and who, who decides that. I think when it comes to Islam, obviously, then we have the Muslim leadership that should, that, that should decide that. But at the same time, I think uh, when we are living in the West, uh, the, the Western, I mean, I have faith in the Western, uh, you know, judicial system. I, I strongly believe in it. And you I accept our faith. laws and our constitution. I, of course I do. This, of course I do. We abide by the laws. And our Muslims are supposed to abide by the laws of, of countries they are living in. Because some people have been on to say, uh, basically, well, can I just give you this quote from one of our listeners, and it comes it came into the program about five minutes ago, and uh, it's rather harsh. And it says from William, he called to say that we don't need Muslims in Ireland, especially if they're not interested in conforming to our society's rules. Is that a myth? I, I think, uh, you know, we have to first of all define what are society's rules. I mean, I, I don't uh, see that there is a clash of civilizations. I do see that there are people that are trying to create that gap between, you know, cultures and civilizations. But I believe that human, uh, I mean, as, as a Muslim, I adhere to the Quranic teachings. And the Quran teaches us that uh, the whole world, the whole earth is, uh, is part, it's not, you know, for certain people. And, and uh, it is not a territory that is uh, to be divided. It is. The whole world is uh, for all human and for all mankind. And ethics, and when it, comes, when it comes to, you know, basic ethics, everyone shares the same basic ethics. Today is Friday. It's the day of prayer within your community. What do, do you think will happen today in the world of Islam on this day of prayer? In the world of Islam, um, what will happen is, first of all, the majority of the Muslims uh, scholars that will uh, deliver the Friday sermon, they, of course, they will condemn what happened in, in Paris. They will condemn uh, any, uh, you know, horrific incident, any act of terrorism, because terrorism has no uh, faith and has no role in our religion. Uh, at the same time, I do uh, accept and I know that, uh, acknowledge that there are, there is a minority of Muslims. They are misguided and they are misled and they have misunderstood, uh, you know, Islam. And unfortunately, they are the ones that are giving a very bad name to Islam. And such individuals do exist. So when they speak on Friday, you know, they, whatever they say has nothing to do with the majority. We have to go by what the majority says. The majority condemns this act. We Muslims are actually suffering at the moment the most from terrorism and extremism. Uh, in Pakistan, more than 100,000 people have been killed the past few years. In Syria and Iraq, thousands of people are being killed. And Muslims are being killed, in fact. So we are the ones that are suffering from extremism, from terrorism, in the name of Islam the most. And I think uh, this is probably the right time that we sit together, not only the Muslim leadership, but at the same time, uh, I think this is the, the duty of the world leaders to sit together and try together to come with a solution to eliminate extremism and eliminate terrorism. Finally, Doctor, you will be coming to our WIT soon to speak. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes, uh, there, there is a, a talk uh, entitled Islam, Jihad and Terrorism, uh, in which uh, basically I aim to uh, give the, the, the audience an insight to 
uh, what the Islamic perspective is on jihad, what the Islamic perspective is, uh, you know, on terrorism, and at the same time that when when there is terrorism and it is associated with Islam, uh, how to deal with it and what is the solution? Because that is the most important thing that people often do not talk about. There is a fire. Uh, everybody talks about who started the fire. Nobody talks about who is going to, uh, you know, distinguish the fire. So I think that is important also to come up with solutions. How can we eliminate this, this extremism uh, that is found uh, at the moment? And at the end of that talk, there will be, of course, uh, a session of question and answer, question and answer session. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank really you. Really appreciate much. that. Goodbye. God bless. Bye bye. Thank you.